Hi there. Let's talk about the way in which art supports and promotes the idea of royalty and the identity of royalty in Africa. This is an idea that, of course, we've talked a little bit about when we were looking at the pharaohs of Egypt, the symbols of power that they possessed, that they maintained, and the ways in which the cult of the pharaoh was a very important way in which the culture just sort of disseminated itself through the whole society. In many parts of Africa, the idea of art is still a very important part of the office of the nobles and what they make or have made for them, excuse me, is some of the important symbols that feature their distinct role in the society. So I want to talk a little bit about the nature of kingship and how art kind of ties into that role in African society. The idea of royal power is often characterized as someone who must be sort of apart from everyday life. They are, in some ways, isolated, veiled, shielded, uh, masked. They speak indirectly or through other people or in a coded way. And all this way of kind of keeping them from being a part of everyday life is an important way in which the king gains authority by having a certain kind of aloof, but very importantly, impartial. They don't directly identify with one family or one group. They're not personally uh, from this area. They sort of rise above it. And because of this unique position, they are able to sort of judge impartially all people within their kingdom. And this is a very important role that the king has, is sort of the adjudicator, person who can judge fairly and reason competently. And so very important is this kind of separation from everyday life. Another very important part about being a king is the way in which the king adopts unique symbols of status that are distinct to their reign. Things that people recognize, in this case here, a very Western-style king with ermine robe, lined robes, and tall golden crowns, and attendants with scimitars. All of these are symbols of royal authority that the king adopts as a way of kind of showing their power not only within the context of Africa, but also very often kind of drawing from symbols of power from far away, showing their ability to draw these things to them, that their office is not just something that was deemed here, but something, again, larger that has connections to the outside world. Here, also, the king remains religious through having controls over certain material goods and the symbols of status. There are certain things that kings can wear, certain things that they alone have control over, certain resources that they alone have control over, and this allows them to not only display uh, their, you know, very, their value and their important sense of distinction, But this also is a way of kind of, then they can pass on some of these materials to their immediate supporters. And then by passing on these materials, these rare materials, they are in a sense gaining their loyalty. And this is a very important part of the role of a king, is not only to display the symbols of power and control those resources as a way of kind of doling out uh, boons and gifts to people who have shown loyalty to them. Because a king is only a king in relation to everybody else, and the people accept them as king. Uh, This idea of divine ruler that comes from, you know, birth is more conditional in Africa. And we'll talk about that a little bit later. The idea that you need to demonstrate, you need to prove and perform your role and and show that you are worthy of being king. 
Another very interesting idea in the symbols of power we often see in African art and the idea that that uh, women or women's symbols or symbols of women are featured prominently. The king here, this is a stool that a king would sit on that displays uh, a woman supporting him. And so by the king's presence here, he is showing that he is not just, you know, a ruler of men being a man, but he has and was and, and possesses this support of women and that this very important connection to women's power and women's place in society, that the king is uplifted and that their power is an important connection to the role of women as well. And we'll see different ways in which people have sort of featured or, or calling attention to the way, the role of women in the, the royal society. Now, this choky stool uh, also is a, is a really beautiful example. You see those sort of brass tacks that are uh, covering the body here, sort of adorning the body around the face and on the arms and legs, and then a rim all around the base. Brass tacks like this would have been an imported item, would have been something that the king would have traded with foreigners for. And so here represents, again, this kind of exotic material that they alone have access to and is, again, a symbol of their exclusive power. And likewise, earlier, when we looked at the Yoruba king covered in beads, if you remember uh, from our earlier discussion of the divining, the Babalawo, they have the, they're given the authority to wear and use beads in a very limited way. But the king is, of course, completely covered in beads. And beads, of course, are these very rare commodity at the time, historically, uh, not so much today. But the symbol of the, the beads maintains this idea of the king's ability to draw rare and uh, valuable resources from far away. Part and parcel of the idea of the king is the relationship to the king's ancestors and that they come from a lineage and that they have access to the knowledge of the past. And so very often we have uh, these sort of shrines that are used to sort of embody the ancestors of the past and the way that the king then keeps those in his company is a way to have the king's authority uh, because he can draw from that great wisdom of the past. Here among the Kota people of Gabon, they make these extraordinary reliquary figures. These are guardian figures. They are not the ancestor itself, but merely uh, a figure that is standing guard protecting the ancestor's remains. You'll see the sort of diamond-shaped form at the base. That actually represents the idea of arms reaching down and holding and uh, embracing the bundle. And as you see over here on the right, typically there would be a kind of bundle that is wrapped and uh, adorned. And inside that bundle would have been ashes and remains or maybe a few bones, a skull bone of the ancestor. Um, carefully preserved and, and kept in, as a kind of vessel of some kind. And that could be a ceramic vessel or any kind of vessel that might hold that. So the Kota people of Gabon no longer actually make these um, reliquary figures. Uh, we have a lot of them that have sort of found their way into museums. You see they really have a, an extraordinary and surprising variety of facial features and uh, very dramatic uh, ways in which they represent the human body and face. What's remarkable about these and what we know from sort of piecing together the history of these is that the amount of metal on the face is directly relates to the wealth and the prosperity of the people who were uh, honoring their ancestors. So the idea was to put lots of metal on that you could for copper and brass sheeting that was nailed onto the wooden forms as a way of kind of demonstrating this. Another part of the history here of West Africa is that a lot of the wealth 
that was generated to produce these objects actually came from the sale of slaves. And this is a part of the history of West Africa, which of course is um, quite terrible and hard to recount, but the fact that many thousands, millions of people were sold into slavery by their own African people. Here is a Kota reliquary ensemble. And again, you can see now not only the figure there, but now the entire bundle that would uh, contain the bones and remains, uh, partial remains of an ancestor. And then this object rests on top of it as a way of kind of protecting and uh, ensuring the security of the, the ancestor's spirit. Now I want to talk more about a kingdom in central Zaire uh, called Cuba, the Cuba people. And in this kingdom, they have a whole variety of different symbols and objects they use to celebrate and honor their royal court and especially their king. The Cuba kings often feature a very important fabric. We'll talk about more about this fabric when we go into the subject of textiles. But the, the design on the fabric is ma'am, or the creeper vine. And it's this sort of diamond-shaped, complex weave of a form sort of interlocking with an incredible uh, variety to them. And we see this ma'am creeper vine design all throughout royal regalia. It is a sense of the interconnectedness of, of the royal power, the idea that it spreads outward in all its forms and its glory, and it's sort of connecting all things together under the auspices of the royal court. The Kudba kingdom was a conglomerate of several smaller principalities and various ethnic origins sometime around 1625. An outsider unseated the rival ruler and unified the area's chiefdoms under his leadership. So we're talking about a kingdom that has pretty substantial history. For each of the kings of the Kuba kingdom, they are honored after they pass away with a small sculpture, which is like the Kota reliquary figures. This it doesn't have any sort of repository of bones or artifacts, but it is a sculpture that depicts the, the king in this sort of idealized way. And this is the Inda. It represents the king through a symbol called the Ibol. The Ibol, in this case, in front of here is the drum, uh, represents Mishi Misheang Mambo. And this is the, the king that uh, has a very important role in the kingdom. And so then as he's, he is deceased, this figure is there and is a part of the next king's ability, again, to have counsel and discuss the ways of the kingdom. And so that the, the presence of the former kings is there with the current king. The head is always proportionately larger than the rest of the body, signifying the head as the sort of center of life. We'll see this a lot in West African art. The figure was regularly rubbed with camwood and palmwood oil to give it a figure a shiny red burnish quality. Again, like we saw with the twins figures in the Yoruba, this kind of rubbing with oil often later obscures and blurs off a lot of the features of the figure. The founder of the Kuba dynasty identified so closely with the patronage and promotion of lavish women and embroidered textile that he adopted the term for Rafiapam, Shayam, as his name. Shayam Abu Ug or Shayam the Grape. The spirit of invention has led to a proliferation of textile designs. Literally hundreds exist, many of which are named after individuals, such as the king of the textile artists who first created them. This is, goes back to our designs in the Ma'am creeper vine designs. Here you can start to see two of these endops together, and you can start to see how the proportions of the head, the ebol, the differences of them, how though the figure is very stylized, it still has a kind of way of representing the king 
in a distinctive way. Sha'amba Balongo Go, the 93rd Niyimi, reigned from 1600 to 1620. So this is a quite old. And Mishi Mishing Mambo may be one of the oldest in Dop, still surviving from some time in the 1760s. So another interesting artifact we have here to describe the Kuba kingdom is this wax resist dyed fabric, which is a map of the king's uh, compound. And it's really important when we think about the way in which the king's compound becomes a kind of center or locus of power where people come together and are able to sort of sense the order of the universe is a reflection of the king, the order of the king's compound. So this is going with indigo dye. Indigo is a fairly common deep blue, almost black dye. We've talked about it. Traders, the Tuareg, also are known for their indigo dyes. Another important office symbol of the Kuba king is the is yet girdle. The king's uh, office is often associated with certain symbols of power that are accumulated along a ring waistband that then hangs off his waist and is, again, a part of symbols of the ocean. The kingdom is very far from the sea, so someone who could command seashells and has access to those kinds of rare things from the ocean. Um, this is, again, a very important part of his symbol. We also see symbols of animals and other creatures, powerful creatures that the king should be able to command and have the authority of those kinds of objects. Now I want to talk about a tri-part symbols of royal authority. You can see them all together here, these three masks. These are not worn by the king, but they do are worn by uh, people who are close to the royal family, though not directly in line to become king. And these three men who play these roles embody the very important dynamic that a king is not alone in his office and that his ability to rule is really contingent on his ability to command and exert the influences on other people. And that is demonstrated in these sort of theatrical performances of these three masks where each performer comes forward and sort of performs their, their character. So the Kuba mask, the most important here, is the one of the king called the Moshambui. And you can see the Moshambui has this kind of peacock array of eagle feathers that spray out above the top of the head. They have this kind of long beard that is actually a lion's mane that has been made into the beard. Um, they have uh, cowrie shells, again, from the ocean that have come a long ways. And so these are all the symbols of power that Moshambu is, is promoting. The elephant mask here, which is not as grand or spectacular, it does have this kind of long cylindrical tube that comes off the top of the head. And this is the sort of the trunk of the elephant. The elephant mask is not a royal mask, but is actually a symbol of the office of people who are uh, close to the king, the people who are uh, important nobles in the royal court. Uh, these are the masks they would wear as a way of kind of showing their allegiance and their fealty to the king. You'll notice that the stylization of the face, the use of cowrie shells, and many of the designs and patterns are kind of closely related to the Moshambui mask. And so these masks, uh, the elephant Mukinga mask, would be featured uh, whenever there was a funeral for someone in the royal family. These people would come out to present their, uh, their respects. Another one of the important Kuba masks is the boom. The boom represents an indigenous person who was originally in the area that the uh, Moshambui has come in and now rules over. And so the Boom has a kind of authority of his own. He is the people there. 
He is a, a mask of, of striking power. He has this big, broad forehead and his big, pursed lips. And again, has some of the cowrie shells, but it doesn't have the same sort of abstract, bold design as the, the Moshe Bui mask. The Boom mask is performed as a way, again, recognizing that the king has to acknowledge the authority of the Boom. And how does the Boom enter into being ruled over by the Moshe Mbui? Well, a part of this story is that the Ingadi Mawash, the third of these masks, actually represents the sister wife of the king, who is here to attract the boom and carry favor with the boom. And the boom is then drawn into uh, loyalty with the, the Ngadi Mawash, the, the, the Ngadi Mawash, the, the wife. These lines that streak down from the eyes represent her tears. The diamond checkered pattern, again, is a symbol of a kind of power over opposites, the cowrie shells, royal authority, and design. It's a very powerful, beautiful mask, the Ngadi Mawash. So in the royal drama, she is prostituted, prostituted by Woot to attract followers. Lines below her eyes reveal the hardships women face, symbolizing her tears. The black and white triangles represent the black stones of the hearth and domesticity. It's the person who is in the home. 